So uh, before we start, let me explain a little bit what we are going to do today and, and how, how this works, right? Uh, so we're doing this webinar with Nova. I'm going to moderate this uh, webinar. It's going to be a panel. And here we have three panelists, three people from Nova in Liverpool that are going to be answering different questions about what the program is, uh, what is the, the investment philosophy, what kind of startups they are looking for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let me introduce them one by one. So I'm going to start with Paul Morisset. Paul Morisset is the, the chairman in Nova. He's going to tell us in a second what is Nova and what the philosophy is. But he's the chairman. He's also a professor, uh, multiple times professor. Uh, from multiple universities, and well, he has been investing in startups all his life. He has been an entrepreneur himself, and he will tell us more about himself later. Then we have Luke. Luke is the, the one that is managing the pipeline of startups uh, and uh, coordinating the investment decisions uh, for all the startups. And also here we have Alistair. Alistair is the chief marketing officer in, in Nova. Uh, and he's handling all the marketing activities for startups and candidates, as well as marketing activities for investors uh, into, into Nova, which are going to invest into, I mean, that those investments are channeled into the, into the startups, right? Um, very good. And before we start about this topic, which is the, today about uh, Nova and the co-foundry model and, and our activities in Asia, what is, what is going to happen in Asia, I'm going to do um, some basic uh, explanation about how the webinar is going to work. So uh, it's going to be a panel. We're going to ask questions. As the moderator, I'm going to be asking many questions. But you can ask questions as well. So if you go to the question and answer uh, button at the, at the bottom of the, of the screen, over there, you can ask questions. Uh, and, uh, and you can also vote for questions of other people. Maybe other people have asked has the same question as you. You can vote. And what I'm going to try to do is ask all the questions that you ask. Uh, but obviously, I'm going to start for those questions that are the most voted one, right? So this is what is what we are going to do today. It, we hope it's going to take one hour. It might go a little bit farther than one hour. And uh, there are four blocks of questions here today in, in this panel. So we're going to start discussing about what is NOVA, uh, what NOVA is, is, is going to do in Asia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Uh, then we are going to go to the second block. And the second block is, what is the venture building philosophy that NOVA has? How, what, what, are, what are the beliefs that NOVA has about how to build ventures and how to minimize the risk of these ventures? Uh, block three is going to be about the value proposition for the entrepreneurs. What is the value that NOVA can bring to the table? What are the kinds of entrepreneurs that NOVA is looking for? Because not every investor is suitable for every kind of entrepreneur. And this is something we're going to explain. And then we're going to have a block four about uh, the application process uh, for NOVA. Uh, this is the first one of five webinars that we are going to do now for Asia in October and in November. Uh, so let me explain briefly what they are. The first webinar, which is today, is about the co-foundry model and introduction to NOVA. Uh, the second webinar, uh, and that's going to be next week, is going to be about how to get traction. Uh, actually, the investment decisions in NOVA are mainly driven by that. And uh, so there will be a webinar about that and about how to do the research that shows that you are likely to get traction in your business idea. Webinar number three is about pitching an idea. Then webinar number four, which is going to be the week after, is a pitching workshop in which you are going to be pitching ideas, your ideas, and your problems. Actually, I should say your problems, because NOVA is not focused on ideas. It's focused on problems. Uh, and number five, webinar number five, is the demo day. And that is going to be in mid-November. And we will provide more details about that. So this is just an introduction. Uh, but let me start with the, with the topic today, right? So I'm going to start with, uh, with Professor Paul Morisset. And, uh, and the first question I think that uh, everybody here in this panel is, is uh, or all, all, all the people that are attending this uh, webinar, the first question they have is, what is NOVA, right? 
Uh, so Nova defines itself as a co-foundry. What is that exactly? What is a co-foundry? How is it different from other kinds of investors like incubators, accelerators, venture capital? So Professor Paul, what, what is Nova? What is Nova? Interesting question. So <clears throat> you, you're right that the words we coin when talking about Nova, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, I know it's uh, different times in different parts of the, the region where it's, it's midday here in the UK and the sun's shining, but we're all in lockdown. So yeah. it's, a, it's a good and bad. So yes, lots of people ask me this question. What, what does Nova, which we coin a co-foundry? So over the years, we've looked at uh, startups very, very intently, how startups uh, are spawned, how they progress, how they fail. And so we decided that most of the time, and I'll go on to this later, there are, there are five things that, that fail in a startup. But we decided to try and fix those five things, and I'll define them a little bit later, not in this section. Um, and we, we, the real main thing was to provide somebody with a problem, a, 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 an originator, I call them problem originators rather than founders, who has that problem, can articulate the problem, and actually can tell us the subject around that problem that they're very familiar with. We then surround those people with a group of individuals, a whole team that allows them to take that problem through to a product, through to a solution, and then scale it in the market. So we become their co-founders. There's the, the founder or the problem originator, and there's our team. So between us, we become a co-foundry. Uh, and we do it with multiple companies, at the, multiple problems at the same time. So we, we, we chose the word co-foundry because it has some uh, connotations of, of engineering and building. I'm basically an engineer. So we like the idea of building something that goes through like a foundry or a factory. That's completely different from an incubator or from an accelerator or from a traditional VC. Because we provide all the things that that founder needs to examine their problem and then drive it forward. And th those things include... Uh, money, they include the teams with different um, skill sets from marketing to finance to software development to hardware uh, construction, right the way through that, that, that life cycle. So we apply those teams. So hence, we call ourselves a co-foundry. and That's what differentiates us from an incubator, an accelerator or a VC, which tend to only do one of those things. So, so as a follow-up question, from all these things that you have mentioned, which ones are provided by an incubator, which ones are provided by an accelerator? So an incubator usually provides space. It lets you mm -hmm. sit in an environment where there are other founders, other people who are trying to explore their problem. But beyond that, maybe they'll make introductions to people. So that's where the incubator space sits. The accelerators usually are taking ideas that have already gone through the initial stage and need some acceleration. So they provide things that will let them accelerate. Maybe they bring in a virtual CTO or a virtual CFO, or bring in something else which that company needs to accelerate. So that's the difference between an accelerator and a VC really provides a little bit of governance and money. So we, we okay. take all of those things and put them into the same environment. Okay, very good. Thank you, Paul. And, and now, now the, the next question will be, based on every, this, uh, all this that you have told us about what is the co-foundry model, how it works, then what kind of entrepreneurs is Nova looking for, right? Um, so, Luke, uh, what would you take about what kind of entrepreneurs Nova would, is looking actively for, what would like to work with? Yeah, you are mute. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> for, for Nova, there, there's a few, there's two things. There's entrepreneurs that fit with uh, the profile that we're looking for and the right personality traits. And then there are entrepreneurs and businesses that fit into the right stage as well that, that's really key. So the first thing for us is we will work very early with entrepreneurs um, from pre-product all the way up to product market fit. So we're really looking to get involved um, along that initial funding journey or, or, or immediately afterwards. Um, and, and that's because to provide, you know, that the co-foundry is about providing uh, a, 
an environment for innovation and that's where we specialize so if you already think you have a great idea for a product and you're not very flexible then you're better off finding a developer or an agency but for us if you're an early stage entrepreneur uh, you're flexible and you are key to work in that setting that is what we need from um, a, you know a profile point of view uh, personality wise what's key for us is someone who's focused outside of the building so you know we've got a big team that, that did all sit in an office together now we all sit at home um, and we like to partner with people who can tell us something about the world outside and about what products need to be developed to meet those market demands so if you're you know we're looking for an outdoor uh, outside the building customer focused uh, flexible person the way this manifests the way we identify these people is typically through some early stage of traction so an, a founder who's been able to go out with a concept and a problem that they could resonate with their customers and they were able to get early traction that says to us that they are customer focused they're flexible and they're ready for for that journey and and look these people would they be uh entrepreneurs that are already full-time in their company or will there be people who are working on something else and they have a business idea but they have not yet really created an mvp what what kind of people yeah so um both but you know historically a lot of our in this early stage it's so risky many of the best i um best problem originators as paul called them the best people to start these um companies haven't got the right profile to just quit their jobs and throw themselves into this. So we have a program in which we can structure part-time work with the founder in that beginning period so that we can build a product and take risk out of it before we scale. Um, but likewise, you know, every business um, wants as much focus and time as possible from, from the people with insight. So if we come across someone who's in a position where they can give that time to the, to the startup, then, then fantastic we'll, we'll make use of that time but absolutely we, we've worked with entrepreneurs who are doctors and then doing this on the side or doing a company on the side or lawyers so it gives them the chance to try and scale up their company build a product without you know selling your house and, and quitting your job so um yeah very good very good well excellent excellent and Alistair, then okay so i i understand the, what is the co-foundry model, what is the kind of entrepreneurs. Uh, so people here, we have 73 people in the webinar, they understand that. Now the question will be, okay, so then uh, how many startups has Nova uh, funded? Uh, how, many, how many startups do you, do you fund every year in the UK? How many have you funded until, until now? Uh, what is the kind of success rates that you have? Uh, so tell us a little bit about the startups. Yeah, sure. So um, the, the, we've been growing over the past 12 years to the point where we are now. Um, we're kind of hitting a stride rate at the moment in terms of quantity of startups that we start each year of 20. So our target in the UK is to start 20 new startups every single year. Um, and to date, we've started north of 80 um, startups. Currently live in our portfolio, I think we have north of 45. So it, 45 it, surviving startups, right? Yeah, that's what you exactly. And that, that's kind of critical for us in, in our whole process, the, what we're trying to affect here, and Paul alluded to it, I mentioned it earlier, is affect the, the rate of success um, that you might have within a startup. So that the wide, widely accepted um, success rate in a startup is 90% of the time you're going to fail, 10% of the time you'll succeed. Um, we're all about shifting that dial and trying to um, move that dial much further kind of up. So our current success rate is about 50%. Very, very good. Okay, excellent. And what are some of the examples of these successful startups, those startups that have been really uh, having some uh, great impact? Uh, Paul, can you tell us about those maybe two, three, four startups that you remember because they have been very successful? Yeah, uh, you've got to go back, I think, to um, understand the ambition of startups and the and the end-to-end -end journey of startups. Our, our belief is that they don't appear overnight. The, 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 one of the big things is that they actually don't, it takes time to bring a startup from an idea through to a successful business, which has grown and scaled. So it, it's not an overnight success. It's not an overnight uh, recipe, which is partly the reason why, why VCs are, are skeptical about getting in very, very early. They'd rather get in when our companies have scaled and show traction.
but that's that's not our model our model is to stay with this problem originator so we're bringing through new ideas which effectively weren't even on the market when when the vc started looking so this is this is all new new, new venture if you like that's coming in uh, so with that as a background our, our uh, we, we, we tend to think that these companies probably take anything between five and eight years to come to a point where they're very successful in scale. So to answer your question, I need to go back five or eight years to our original companies and show and tell you the ones that have succeeded there. I've, I've gone through that journey and, and I've moved into another uh, scale. So there's three I can talk about. The first one is uh, a company, one of our first companies that we invested in, which was called Centric Music. So Centric Music is, is a, effectively a, an ecosystem, a platform where independent musicians can claim uh, money back for their, either their performances or their songs or their rights. As individuals, it was very difficult for them to do that, if not impossible. And the, uh, the entrepreneur or the, the uh, problem originator came to see Andy, Andy and I, Andy's the uh, CEO, uh, many years ago and said, listen, I, I, I think people are screwing me. I can't get the money for my performances and my, my uh, individual yeah. rights. So we built a platform uh, together with, uh, with the founder who was the subject matter expert. He knew how much they were supposed to be getting per performance. That company is, uh, is now in its uh, series B. Um, and we've effectively got out of that company now. We've sold it on. So we've seen the realization. And we had a thousand percent increase in our in the value of our of our investment, thousand percent, which is huge. Um, so that one is we're out of that now. Uh, second one is is a games company. Uh, you know, I'm talking about a, a gaming company called Lucid Games, who we we invested in very very early on. In fact, at inception, that was a company that came to us and said, you know, we we don't know what space to work in. We've got some great skills. So we helped uh, collaborate a team around them to build up these, these gaming assets, mainly in first person shooter or driving. And that, that company is now at series B as well, but it's, we're not out of it, we're still in it, we still have an investment in it. And again, that's, a, you know, we're talking tens of millions of pounds valuation. Um, the third one, and Alastair, you're going to have to help me with this, or Luke, what was the financial services company? Door. Door, right. So this is an interesting um, example because it doesn't follow our usual model. It was two guys who had a, a tremendous idea in the financial services market. One of them was in Boston and the other one was in London. And you may think, why the heck did they come to somewhere in Liverpool? But we were the only place that actually would experiment with their idea with them. So they, they built up this, it was a brokering, uh, financial services brokering system aimed at people like uh, um, Morgan & Morgan, you know, sort of JP Morgan, uh, all the big investment houses. Uh, we built their tech because uh, they, they actually had the vision. And they knew the market, but didn't know how to build the tech. We built their tech for them, did their social media marketing and drove them forward. In fact, very early on, one of those big companies decided that they wanted to own this tech. And so they bought us out very, very early on and took the tech. And, and now the tech, we're still supporting a little bit of the tech, but it's, it's actually got out. We, we did very well in that. We had, I think, a 250% increase in our valuation on that, that asset. And that happened within 18 months. But that's very, very unusual. So there's three examples, Pedro. So, so if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but all these three examples are companies uh, the, from which Nova has exited or partially exited, right? Yeah, they, 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 they're further along the journey. So these are so, so, Yeah, they're not, uh, you know, we, we don't always completely exit because we are, as a co-founder, we own some of the equity in the business. But, you know, if, if the business needs external equity to grow, then we, we're, we're very encouraging of that. Okay. Very good, very good. Well, so Nova, uh, we, we have not said it, but Paul just mentioned, is based, originally started in Liverpool, in case uh, you didn't notice uh, from the accent, not my accent, but, uh, <laughs> but their accent. 
uh, started in Liverpool, the UK, and now Paul is expanding to Asia, right? So Paul, tell us uh, a little bit more about what is the strategy for Asia. Here we have in the call people from Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and Jakarta. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the the, the Asia, Asia expansion and Asia strategy, and in general, maybe the international strategy of, of NOVA. Well, it is, uh, uh, thanks Pedro, it is an international strategy, that's, that's the, the thing. So, we, we um, within NOVA UK, or NOVA as we know it today, which is based in, in, in Liverpool in the UK, we get ideas and problems from globally, but some from uh, Pakistan, some from Africa, Obviously, I'll just explain one from the US. So, but what, what, when we started looking at this in greater detail, I think what we, we decided was we really need to get closer to the problem originators. And so okay. having, having a, a version of Nova in Asia gets us closer to the Asian market. We understand the market more. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not looking for only uh, companies which can scale in a particular market. We're very interested in global expansion. but to get close to those problems and those problem originators, we believe we probably need to be geographically housed closer to them than the middle of Liverpool. So we, we, we're looking at various options, but uh, Nova Asia is the one which is the most advanced and the one that we're, we're putting all these efforts into. Okay, very good, excellent. Um, excellent. Now we're going to discuss a little bit about Nova's venture building philosophy, right? Which is not the typical approach of any investor. It's not the way uh, that an angel would approach uh, a startup. It's not the way that uh, an accelerator or, a, or an incubator would approach it. Um, so Nova is using a, well, a very uh, well-known methodology that is called the Lean Startup Methodology for Venture Building. And uh, well, I'm going to address the, the question to Paul, but uh, all of you can chip in. What is a lean startup? What is this lean methodology uh, that you are using in order to build startups? Okay, I, I'll start, but I'm going to pass it over to Luke and, and um, Alistair because they're really the experts in this. When we first started, we started looking at why we, we, our, our traditional um, philosophy has been to invest in multiple companies so we can maximize the teams that we're providing into those companies. Uh, and over the, the, the years, we've seen that companies fail. O obviously, companies fail. In fact, the, uh, the global average for tech company failure is 92%, which is just ridiculously high. Uh, and we decided to look at it with a different lens. It was more like, why are they failing, not how do you pick the ones that are succeeding? Because there's a bigger cohort of failures than there are successes. So we, we started looking very intently at the reasons for failure. And, and there, are, there are five big reasons for failure that, that we actually identified. And that's basically what our process does. As we moved along the, uh, our maturity journey, we started looking at other people who were uh, working in this space. And that we, we got very close. We looked at Osterwalder's... Um, business model canvas. We looked at a few uh, um, ones that we thought would help us evaluate our, um, our startups or our, our problems. The one we settled on the end was one which was um, produced by a guy called Ashmoyer, which is effectively lean, a lean startup. Uh, and we have a, a model for, for, for taking people through the lean startup. But just to move quickly to the reasons why startups fail, and I know you wanted me to try and explain this, Pedro. So the five top reasons why they fail is building this something. This is one of the questions that we had here. There is one, to, one, uh, of the, one of the people here has asked us this question. Uh, um, so yeah, what are the, the five reasons why startups fail, Paul? Okay, so the five main reasons for failure we've done through our research and quite extensive research. Number one, is building something nobody wants. That's amazingly, <laughs> you know, you would think to yourself, well, wh why would that happen? Well, it's because people believe that they know the market and the market actually isn't in sympathy with them or in sync with them. So that's, that's number one. Number two is bringing on the wrong people, hiring the wrong people to take your idea forward. That's a very, very um, big issue in, in failure. 
The next one is when you've got to there is failing to execute on sales and marketing strategy. How do you get your product out into the market? This, and Luke will talk to you about the, the uh, solution fit, product fit, and all that sort of thing in a few minutes. But that, that particular area is, is very, very uh, prone with, with uh, failure. Um, we call it the chasm of disillusionment. People think, oh, how, how the hell have I got to get this up? And they just throw sales and marketing strategy and money at it. Um, the next one is not hiring, very similar to number two, hiring poor, poorly. Number four is not hiring the right co-founders. In other words, bringing people into the business as founders, giving equity away to people who don't necessarily deserve it or don't necessarily deserve it. And very, very easy to say when I'm starting, I need to raise money. And you then say to some, some guy or, or gal, uh, can you raise the money for me? And if you do, I'll give you 10% of the company. So that is that, co-founder conflict. It's co-founder conflict, yes. But that's basically where it is. And the next one is actually the, 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 per, the originator chasing investments and not chasing customers. In other words, not validating their model. They, they, their, their whole ethos about this problem being big enough actually pales in insignificance because they need to, to feed the ship. They need to get money in all the time. And their, their efforts are concentrating on money raising rather than development of their product or service. So they're the five main reasons. But I'll okay. hand over to, to Alistair and, and Luke some maybe a little yeah. more detail on, on the so, lean. So Alistair and Luke, so Paul has introduced uh, the, the lean methodology. Uh, but what does it really mean? when you are on the ground building the startup, what does it really mean? What kind of things you have to look at? Uh, what is it, the Lean methodology? Maybe we can start with Luke. Yeah, thank you. So what does it mean in practice? Yes, so Lean yeah. as a philosophy is a great way for combating those, those big problems that Paul spoke about. Um, I think if we focus on the first one, but it's clear how it can apply to all of them. So building something that nobody wants is probably the greatest waste of all, like putting all this effort and energy and passion and money into something to make it operate in a really great way. But ultimately you can make a product, but you can't make a market. And if there's no market for it, you have just wasted, you know, an, an unbelievable amount of, of, of time and, 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 and resource and maybe even passion for the business. What lean means is no waste. So it doesn't mean cheap and it doesn't mean poor quality. It means everything we do is measured. Everything we do is in as small of iteration as possible so that if we don't get the results that we thought we were gonna get, we have plenty of flexibility to iterate and, and move through that journey and find the right solution, not just the first solution. So the way it manifests itself on a day-to-day -day basis means that you as a founder might have a really advanced version of the product you wanna build, but because you've got your own biases, you've got your own view on the world, you need to systematically test that before you spend your whole budget building it. So the way it would operate with us is we would be challenging you on your assumptions, we would be asking for evidence and data, and we would be trying to minimize the amount of investment effort at each particular question, so that when you come out of the program, you might not have built the initial idea that you had all the way through, but what you have built, you can be truly confident is well validated, it's scalable, people are gonna want it. So at least then you can set off on the right direction. Um, other aspects of the co-foundry model, you know, you can apply this to hiring people, you know, hiring them too early is a fast way to burn through money and a fast way to, to cause a lot of pain. Are there other um, cheaper and better ways to experiment with before making that level of commitment? So it's all about measuring the level of um, resource within the company against the key assumptions and risks that the company needs to, to answer. So that's how it manifests against those, um, each of those problems, really. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so, so basically, and so therefore that topic of consumer research, market research is so important. And this is, uh, this is gonna be the topic of the second panel, right? The second, the second webinar that is gonna be uh, next week, right? So how do you, uh, do market research uh, by using consumer panels, by using surveys, uh, in order to make sure that what you are building is something that people really want, because you don't want to make the mistake that Paul was talking about, I think it was the first one, about building something that nobody wants, right? Uh, perfect. 
Uh, very good. So let's go to, to, the, to the next uh, block of questions, which is around the value proposition of NOVA uh, for the entrepreneurs, right? So Paul has already told us what is what NOVA provides. So NOVA provides uh, a team of uh, developers, project manager, marketing people, uh, designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Um, and uh, well, so uh, actually, as Paul was describing, that's that's what we call the, the co-founder model, right? Uh, now, the, the question that I would like to ask uh, uh, Alistair about this co-founder model is: uh, I understand this is a guided program, right? So you are being guided. Uh, along a number of stages and investment gates. So what are the different stages and investment gates that are in this program, in the program that startups join uh, with NOVA? Sure. Um, so the, the typical program is it's a, a nine month program mm -hmm. um, and that can be broken down in, into three phases or three um, objectives. So the first kind of investment objective is uh, to achieve problem fit. And that, that typically takes up to a month. Um, and the purpose of that stage is basically just confirm whether there's a problem worth solving. So hitting on some of the points which have been made both by Paul and Luke, you know, first of all, we have to make sure that there is a problem um, and that, that the market is large enough and there's enough people that are facing that problem and it's not just the founder. Um, so the work that you're do, going to be doing over the next month um, is going to be really feeding into that. So that the more work you can do up front, um, the quicker we can move through that stage. And moving through that stage, basically kind of success in that stage is, is measured roughly by getting a meaningful number of users or, or customers um, who connect with that problem. So you can validate that enough people are saying that they feel that problem to such an extent that they're going to commit in some way um, to the founder to help them develop a solution um, that's going to meet their needs. Um, there's going to be evidence of, like, say, like a, an investable market opportunity. Um, and if, if, if we move through those two bits, then the last bit is having a plan, um, which is what you're going to do next. So what you're going to do next is you're going to move on to the, the second phase, um, which is to find a solution fit. That typically lasts up to three months, so two to three months. And the purpose of that stage is to, val to validate potential solutions. Um, and again, as I touched on previously, what we're looking here and for is potential solutions. Um, we're not saying we're not coming into this with a fixed solution. We, we want to move through the problem, get to the point where we validated the problem, then get the market to tell us what the potential solutions could be. And we're going to probably be, well, not probably, we, we'll be measuring the success in this phase. Um, first, again, progress against the, the, the action plan and the metrics, um, which have been written in the previous month. Um, creation of essentially an offer. So like a concept solution, um, a bit of a value proposition and, and a rough pricing model. Um, and then evidence that enough users or customers agreeing that that proposition or offer is correct for them. Um, evidence that the that 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 proposition would lead to a financial model that's going to support um, high growth and then again a concrete plan on what to do next uh, and then the final stage is going to be uh, objective number three or phase number three which is going to be looking at product fit now this is the bit that takes the most amount of time um, as you're actually going to be looking at developing your first pick your phrase, minimal viable product, minimal lovable product, prototype, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, but something that's going to solve the user's problem enough uh, that they're going to start using it repeatedly. And it's, it's that good enough, you know, that this isn't the perfect solution. Um, we want something which is good enough so that people will want to use it repeatedly um, and be probably quite pained if you pull it away from them. So again, the, the kind of the things that we'll be looking for there are uh, progress against the, the metrics, which you'd set out previously, um, the creation of that product or prototype or, or what, you want, what, what you want to call it. Um, and then starting gathering that kind of like uh, the, the evidence. So user feedback um, and analytics that are going to be showing that people are using it, um, that, that they're starting to use it more and more. Um, a believable business model. We kind of start going into actually like the workings of how this business might look through a five-year profit and loss. 
Um, and then again, a plan for the next stage, which is essentially what are you going to go out and how are you going to raise um, the next substantial round? Um, and that's kind of the, the, the way that we break it down into those three stages. Okay, so if I can paraphrase, stage number one is problem fit, stage number two is solution fit, stage number three is product market fit, correct? Yeah. Okay, and Nova is going to guide uh, the, the, the founders or, or the co-founders, the idea originators, in doing all the necessary research, all the necessary developments, all the necessary MVPs in order to go uh, across all these three phases, right? That's, that's basically the problem. Yeah, well, I, I guess what you say there is that Nova is going to guide the founder through that. We, we, we will guide and we will mentor and we will coach, but we're going to be delivering on that. You know, we're going to be applying our resource to that company as co-founders. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to educate and we're going to guide, but we are going to actually execute. Very good. And then what is, Alistair, what, what comes after the normal... Uh, what comes after the NOVA program in the normal life cycle of a startup? What happens in month number nine? Yeah, so month number nine, uh, we will take a kind of a deep breath and, and look what happened. Um, there the, are the, the typical kind of stages within a, in a startup's life cycle, which will move into kind of market fit or growth stage um, where you're looking to achieve what you said, product market fit. So that's having a business model um, or a product or route which can be scaled, um, nailing that down. Then the, 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 the life cycle of a company will naturally move into its scale side, where it actually starts looking at um, operational efficiencies of the company. Um, now, in terms of Nova and its support, you know, as uh, Paul alluded to, we'll stay with the company for as long as it makes sense as a co-founder. Um, the resource and support that we provide into companies can flex, it can be adjusted um, to support the needs of, of, of the company. Um, but ultimately, at some point, Nova will start to retreat out in terms of its um, resource support. So as a company starts to form its own team, um, it makes sense for that company to form its own team, we will start to step back. But in terms of investment and partnership, we, we, we want to be there as long as possible. So at that moment in month number nine, is that the moment in which uh, the company should be looking for additional funding, right? What kind of series or what kind of investors do startups typically look for uh, after, after the program? Um, yeah, or I mean, well, or, so, so, or will potentially Nova uh, do a, a, a second investment? Yeah, so Nova will almost certainly be doing the second follow-on investment at that stage. Um, and again, Nova will try and stay on um, as an investor for a, a, as long as possible. We work, again, as, as a co-founder in the company. So if, if Nova is, if it makes sense for Nova to be the sole investor at that stage, because we're still in a deep R&D phase, um, that the Nova will be the sole investor that will provide all the capital required. If we're starting to go to market, um, a little bit more aggressively at that time, it might make sense for us to bring in um, an outside source of capital. Um, Nova will still invest, but it might make sense for us to co-invest alongside somebody who has specific market experience or specific kind of access to different areas within a market. Um, so it, again, it's, it's really dependent on what the company needs, but we have the ability to uh, follow our investment all the way through and if needs be at that nine month be the sole investor but again it just comes down to what the company needs uh, sorry alice that's paul here uh the other thing there is that obviously if an ex external investor comes in to the company at that point it actually values the company at, at that level so it's, it's an important stage when a, an external investor comes in we're not just mm -hmm. investing our, we're not marking our own homework if you like and that's what you did with Door. Exactly. And it's, okay. it's, what, it's what we've done with the majority of all our portfolio so far. Okay. Uh, that there are very few companies which get beyond kind of, you know, the, the year one and haven't had some form of external investment to provide that market validation of value. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, the next question is the question that a lot of people are asking here in the, in the chat. So the question is basically, what is the amount uh, of the typical investment and how much equity does Nova take from the startups? Sure. Um, so it's, it's an interestingly phrased question, that one. How much equity does Nova take um, from the startup? So 
first and foremost, it's like we've got to go back to what the, the actual business model is and that, that we're a co-foundry. So we believe we're truly co-founding a business um, with, a, with a potential founder. Um, our business model sits in a space of uh, venture builders. If you look at um, venture builders, typically they take about 80 percent. Um, we don't think that that's right. Um, what we're the, the way we actually work and, and I'll kind of break it down to give you an overview of what where the business may be in, in about 12 months from starting with us. Our standard model, if we work with a, a founder, which is an ideation stage, um, we'd both start off uh, agreeing about a 50-50 split. Um, there isn't any investment at the stage. There, there's no cap table. Um, there's nobody there. Um, but we, we would start off with 50-50. And we'd be valuing the company about, in UK terms, £300,000. Um, to bring investment in, um, the Nova co-foundry would dilute down uh, we typically look at bringing in about another three hundred thousand uh, pounds of investment at that stage, which would value the company uh, at six hundred thousand. I think that's roughly about a million um, Singapore dollars. Um, you'd still retain fifty percent, so it's it's Nova co-founder that starts diluting down at that point. Then at the end of that program, um, so if we start to get pro signs of um, product fit. Um, and we're successful at the end of the process, the company's probably gonna have that, um, that product, that prototype, um, and a business model that's gonna be able to successfully attract further investments. Uh, and evaluation at that point should exceed uh, a million pounds, um, you, you know, cl close to two million um, Singaporean dollars. So at that point as a founder, you're still gonna retain your 50% as we enter that funding round. And therefore, you've got 50% of a company, uh, you know, two, two million Singaporean dollars or, or, you know, a million pounds. So this is basically what happens when you are, when the founder is starting at the ideation stage, you say, yeah. which is basically, uh, is basically a founder who has an idea on a PowerPoint. He doesn't have an MVP and he's typically not uh, full time. Right. That's sure. the kind. That's how it works. That's that's a 50-50 split, right? And then there are uh, there are there are uh, there is this nine-month program with uh, with the investment. What happens when the founder is more advanced than that? Maybe the founder has an MVP. Maybe the founder has. Maybe the founder is full time. Maybe the founder has already done all this problem validation, all this solution validation. What is what happens there in that case? Is it is it a different split? How does it work? Yeah, so at, at that stage, it's, it's a complete bespoke deal. Um, it would depend on multiple factors as a normal VC would. Um, we would see that our value is really in our process, our methodology, um, and, and the way that we operate, as, as well as access to our resource. So we would only obviously be partnering and, and going as a co-founder into a company where that is valued. Um, there would be a value placed on that as well as the size of the market, the stage of the company, what the founder's bringing in, um, and, and multiple factors, but it, it's, it's not as straight cut as there would be this amount of split given at that stage. Okay, so it will be a lower, a lower, um, a lower oh, share yeah. for Nova and, yeah. and a higher share for the uh, entrepreneur because, well, both of them are entrepreneurs, but a higher share for the idea originator because he has done already a lot of the work that is required, right? Yeah, and, right. and, the, and the, I, I would imagine probably at that stage there may be a couple of other people already on the cap table, you know. So, yes, it's, it's so going to be much that, So do you mean that those people who are on the cap table are people that are coming in the same round as Nova or, or that they came before? Or what, what, uh, how, how, what is the typical arrangement? Well, I guess, I guess the, the short answer there is there's not a typical arrangement. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we've gone with people which they've, they've got multiple founders which are coming to us. So obviously the, 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 those founders are, have already gone onto the cap table in, in some effect. Okay. Um, that there may be an individual founder which has come to us and, and that there isn't a cap table yet. They're, they've got 100%. Um, it, it's, it's really a case by case basis. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I understand. Okay, now for the first case, right? The, the case of uh, idea originators who, who just have an idea on, on PowerPoint, right? Uh, this is typically, as far as I understand from my conversations with Paul, this is people who are working professionals and they're very passionate about a the problem. They know the problem and, uh, and, and they want to find a solution, right? Um, but they don't know how to create a startup. 
Now for these guys, uh, they are gonna start part-time with NOVA, right? Yeah. Uh, how is the working arrangement? Do they get a salary? Uh, do how many hours a week do they have to work because they are part-time, right? Um, what is the normal working arrangement for these kind of people? Yeah, um, so again, like typically, uh, the founder doesn't take a salary at this stage because the, the, the value that we add is they don't have to give up their job. Um, and typically kind of within our kind of standard agreement, um, we ask for about eight days a month um, from that founder. And that, that's not going to be eight individual days. That's going to be eight days worth of time over a month um, into the company. And, and over that kind of nine month period, you know, Nova's going to be in, in excess of 500 days. I think it's about 550 days worth of resource in, in that same period. So okay, in, in, term, in terms of like, do founders get paid a salary? Not at the, the outset. Um, within a typical deal, no. But and it's probably worth stating that when, once we get beyond nine months, um, and whether the, whether the nine months comes early or it comes late, is that you know it's not necessarily a fixed date in time, fixed space in time. Um, if the founder needs to, to come into the company and take a founder salary, um, because you know they're, they're going to start working full time on the company um, and they're going to be providing value. Um, to, to the company, then, then yeah, we'll, we'll discuss a founder salary. Likewise, we get a number of founders because of the position that they are in in their existing jobs. Um, quite often, within the healthcare side, they want to carry on their main job. They're solving a problem. Um, they don't want to give up their job, even if the, the the startup starts to get some traction. So, what they want us to do, along with them, is actually go out and hire a CEO to take that company forward, and they'll take an advisory role on the board. Um, so, again, we're completely okay. flexible. So that's quite interesting. What is the Typical moment in which a founder uh, joins the startup full time. Again, there isn't necessarily a typical. There is no moment. typical moment. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's. That's my get out of jail free free, free answer. That, I mean, it's 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 going to be after nine months. It's definitely going to be after okay. nine months. It's it's almost certainly going to be after a year. So it's at, at the point in time when the startup can already has enough funding and has enough traction to afford paying him. Or her a salary. Uh, yeah, but exactly. Yeah, and and again, that that might come early. So if if the if the if the, the startup gets amazing traction really early on, and the prototype is quick to do, mm -hmm. or the MVP is quick to do, um, you know that it might make sense for that company to start taking on the overhead of a founder salary much earlier um, that, than a company okay. which has got a, a long um, a, a long kind of R and D period where the founder. Is not going to be out doing commercial activities as it's largely kind of an in-house function at that stage. Okay, very good. So you, you mentioned healthcare as one of the industries or one of the, the, the verticals where you work, right? Um, I want to ask this question to Paul. Uh, so Paul, what, what are the other main verticals where Nova, where Nova works apart from, from health tech? Well, <clears throat> we're fairly agnostic to tech. But if you ask me what the proportion of uh, historic investments is, um, I think the big ones are health tech, fintech, ed tech, educational tech. We've done a few in property tech and we've experimented with legal tech. So I don't, we're agnostic to the, the vertical, but, uh, you know, s some have more traction than others i mean that's uh, you know that's the that's the reality of of the world but we as long as, as we can uh, fulfill the tech environment then we're fairly agnostic to what vertical it comes from i mean i'm okay. particularly very interested in telecommunications now we haven't done many telecommunications one yet but i'm expecting we will in the future okay very good Excellent, excellent. Well, so now we're gonna discuss a little bit about the application process and, and I'm gonna be discussing that mainly with Luke because as I said before, Luke is the person that is handling the pipeline and the investment process uh, into the startups, right? So um, I, I'm sure that you guys have a lot of detailed questions about this. Um, we're gonna go into your detailed questions a little bit later. Uh, so let me ask some some basic questions about the application process, Luke. So. Uh, I understand that candidates uh, for NOVA have to go into a, a Lean Stack, what is called the LeanStack.com platform, which is gonna uh, provide them some, some 
training or some methodology about what they have to do, right? But at the same time, we have these webinars and there are five webinars. So what is the application process? Some people are wondering, is it, is it okay if I just do the Lean Stack? Is it okay if, if I just do the webinars? Uh, how does it really work? Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Pedro. So the, it all works in combination, really. So Lean Stack uh, was created by the author of Running Lean and Scaling Lean, who, who we've partnered with to help educate founders on mass. We used to do a lot of face-to-face -face coaching in the UK, but obviously that's changed with with both the, the current climate and our international expansion. So we looked at better ways to find the right founders who have the same philosophies as us and the same sort of mindset. So the most important thing is to review some of the content and make sure that it aligns to the way, you know, it, it speaks sense to you. It's something that you want to work as because we are absolutely committed to working in the way outlined by Lean Stack, which is problem first, customer focused and being lean. And, and we won't change that. So if you're reviewing this content and it's completely at odds with the way you think you want to start your company, then that says to us, then, then you know, everyone's got a different opinion. That's fine. It wouldn't be the best fit for either of us to go into this. So the most important thing is it gives you a flavor for how we want to work. But the second thing is it will hopefully educate you in some of the common mistakes, but it will also guide you to produce in some key documents in a really simple to understand way that can be reviewed by both the investment committee team, other investors, and also allow our partners such as, um, you know, in Asia to, to also review very quickly where you're up to. 20 page business plans, you know, we don't read them, A, because we don't have the time, but B, we know they're out of date. Whereas the, the lean canvas and the traction roadmap that it will generate for you are very instrumental and key documents that we can change rapidly and we can progress through the application system. Uh, the webinars are designed to give you context, A, into a bit more into who Nova are, but B, to help you make your application and evidence as strong as possible so that with the pitch that we're, all, we're going to produce at the end through this program, even if you decide not to go for Nova or the other way around, you've still got something that you can be proud of that you've built a strong foundation with. If you in order to proceed through the demo day, we do need all, all of that material. We need to be able to see the business plan on the Lean Canvas. We need to know that you've seen the content so that you want to work um, in the same way we, we'd like to work. Uh, we need the traction roadmap to get a sense of your ambition. How, how far do you want to push this and on what space of time? Um, and we need the pitch video, obviously, so that we can get a feel for the, the overall opportunity. We can share it with the relevant people and we can we can move you through to, to being seriously considered um, for investment. So it all fits together. If you do the lean stack and you've completed the documents, um, myself and Joe can be available for feedback and to, and to go through questions with you guys and, and to give you a bit of feedback on the areas that seem strong and weak and help you articulate. But if you haven't done these documents, it's very difficult for us to help any company, you know, with, with um, any sort of, of, of real, uh, information so it all fits together if you haven't had a link to lean stack let us know and we'll definitely get you set up it doesn't take too long to go through it doesn't take too long to create but you can sp spend the rest of the month improving your proposition with the stuff you're learning from traction and pitching to make sure that it's all together as strong as possible okay so then then what you said is number one they have to prepare a lean canvas right which is a table a number of questions about who your customer is, what problem you are solving, et cetera, et cetera, right? Number two, the, the traction roadmap, right? Which is a mini financial a mini forecast. model, mini yeah, forecast. A mini growth forecast, yeah. Mini, mini growth forecast and what are the drivers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, a video pitch, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and there is a webinar about that that is going to come. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, we'll help you put that together, but that really... You know, I think um, in terms of, of where we're up to anyway, you know, with lockdowns and speaking to investors, it's something that we're encouraging all of our founders to do, even in the UK, is create these pitch videos now, because this is the way you're going to get in front of people, we think, in, yeah. in, in, in 2020. So, yeah, the pitch video will be, will help you create that, we'll give you feedback, we'll make sure that it's as, it's as, as solid as it can be, um, we'll make the we'll be selecting some of the companies during the program to attend the demo day in person and, and pitch live, but everyone will have the chance to make their video uh, and get it reviewed by, by someone at Nova team so that you can do what you want with it after that. Okay.
Okay, very good. And uh, I mean, I, I imagine you have reviewed many, many applications, right? Uh, over the years, because you have been in, in NOAA for many years, right? Um, what differentiates a good application from an average application? Um, sure. So, yeah, we've, we we re review applications every day, and it, it, it's you know the, the best ones are a c quite concise and, and matter of fact and to the point. They're not overselling to us. They're giving us a clear indication of, of what they're trying to do, where they're up to, and where they need help. And um, they're not, not pitching it to us like investors. They're pitching it to us like partners um, who need who need um, support in, in certain areas. So that's the most important thing. Don't oversell it and don't um, exaggerate because if you start with an exaggerated proposition that is sounds amazing but then we only work back from there it would be better to start the other way just start concise what are you doing and then we can build up with you once we get a clear understanding of that and um, the second thing you know it's clear from the language people use where their focus is so if the application says i need help building an app because i want to start a company that does x that's like, you know, for us, that's red flag after red flag. It's about them. It's about building an app. It's about starting a company. Whereas if we read something that says um, this customer segment is, is suffering from this problem, they are underserved in the market for these reasons. This is where I want to target my company's efforts to improving their lives or solving this issue and then tell us about their ideas for an app it comes from a place of, of, of more evidence-based it's not an opinion it's it's more of a hypothesis on the world and um, so that's really helpful if you lead with the customer market and 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 their problems before presenting the fact that you want to build an app or your potential solution is the second thing and then the third thing is just tell us if you've had traction already you know if you spoke to people who have given you good customer feedback if you've created a panel if you started a landing page our view is if you can gain tra traction with a, a, a pretty crappy website and a very you know a, a, ru a rudimentary concept then you should be able to gain a lot more traction with our support so anyone who says things like you know i've got all the designs planned out for the app that's not appealing to us but anyone who says i've got our customers lined up for the next three or four months that's really appealing to us. So customer development over product development um, and just be uh, to the points. Basically, what you are saying- Pedro, Pedro, sorry, Pedro, yeah. it's, it's Paul here. Uh, I'm gonna have to drop guys, but uh, I'll, I'll put my email address in the, um, in the chat. So if anybody wants to send me any questions particularly, they can certainly do that. So this uh, webinar was scheduled for one hour, which is now is the hour. Uh, but there are many questions, so we're going to continue until we answer all the questions. Uh, well, thank you very much, Paul. Okay. Um, so, so coming back to Luke, so what you are saying is that from the language you can identify actually whether a founder is is has what we call founder bias, correct? Yeah, um, pretty much. So can you tell us, I mean, you, you, you have kind of said it before, but can you tell us what is founder bias? Yeah, so founder bias um, often starts in a good place. It's, it's the you know, willingness to try and spot a problem and try and create a solution. But as you go along that process, you become more and more attached emotionally to your own initial idea. And the idea that um, you know, if you were starting a company, would you rather bet it all on idea one or would you rather bet it all on a process that allows you to have many ideas and, and test it quickly to find the right one for the market? A lot of founders would rather do option A. They'd rather build their idea. And if it doesn't work, at least their idea didn't work, rather than this kind of difficult, flexible process where there's not much certainty. We're looking for founders who want to do the second thing. So my initial idea, you know, this is where I've started, but it's just a starting point. We will need to build on each single element of this business plan in order to create something that can reach product market fit okay so so for, from our point of view founder bias is extremely detrimental because it means that we're building for the founder rather than building for the founder's customers so any any application or anything you create should all be about servicing the customers that you know are there or the ones that you've generated rather than building something to go find customers so founder bias you know it, we've all got it, you know, even me, you, me and you, Pedro, we put up this webinar, we think this is what people want. 
could, we could be wrong. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe they don't want it. Yep. Maybe they don't want it, but we need to be <laughs> flexible enough that if they let us know that, then, then we yeah. can change it and produce it better, you know, rather than just keep doing the same thing and hoping it works. So that's why founder bias is something we look out for. We're not looking for you to have eliminated all of it, but to be cognizant of it and to recognize it and to want to improve and want to find real data, then, then we can work with that. Okay, very good, very good. I'm going to start going... Uh, well, now we are uh, on the hour, so it is 9 p.m. in Singapore and, uh, and, and, and Kuala Lumpur, it is 8 p.m. in Jakarta, uh, and I believe it is 2 p.m. in, in Liverpool. Um, we, uh, we are going to answer all the questions that we have here. So I'm going to answer them uh, by the order of votes, of votes that you have. So if you like a question, please vote for it. And we are going to go one by one, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the first one. Uh, Ashraf is asking this question. What about founders with no technology experience and keen on solving the problem and grow a tech startup? How will you support us? And how can the founder be groomed to fit the role? I, uh, but before we answer the question, I noticed that some of you are asking questions on the chat. Uh, that's fine, but uh, ask the questions in the Q&A ses section, uh, which is the next button. I mean, it's not the next, it's the, there is, so you see Q&A, polls, and then chat. Better ask the questions in Q&A rather than on the chat. I'm going to try to go to the chat as well, but uh, it's more, um, it's better suited if you use the, the Q&A. So what will be the question? So how do you help non-technology, uh, non-technical founders? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, um, non-technical founders are our best market, to be honest. We, you know, for, mo for if you are already the perfect startup team, you've got sales, you've got tech, you've got some funding or flexibility to pursue that, you've got the ability to design product, then we're not necessarily the right partner for you guys. Because like Alistair said before, our main value is deploying resource that follows a process onto your company. So if you've already got the ability to create technical stuff, um, you might not necessarily see the full value in that. Now, we still work with technical founders, but they often work with our development team because they're doing either the really difficult stuff or something a bit more strategic or something else. Um, most of our founders, though, are non-technical. We will act as their CTO in that early stage. And if they scale enough, we'll try and hire them a CTO. Um, so, you know, our perfect fit is, is, is someone with that customer development ability because we can provide product development. So, um, yeah, uh, I can't remember who asked the question, but... Um, it was Ashraf. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, you know, our typical model is, is non-technical. Okay, so so if I can paraphrase a little bit uh, what you are saying by using the the Y Combinator terminology, the kind of founders that are the, the best founders in, in, in the Nova world will be those that are doing the activities outside the building while Nova is taking care of inside the building. Is, yeah. is, is that a good way of saying that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, very good. Let's go to this, the next question, uh, Erwin. So Erwin from, from uh, Indonesia is asking these questions. Hi, Nova. Is there any chance that Nova invests to a startup whose team, whose team members are full-time? And how it changes the concept of collaboration between Nova and that startup? I think we have kind of answered that before, but let's, let's go over it uh, once more. So I can pick that one up. Um, so Erwin, yeah, the, uh, the, the question is interesting and it's, it's kind of like littered with Kind of things which which may 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 on may I don't, I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking. So where you're saying um, is there any chance that Nova would invest into a startup who the team members are all full time? Um, yeah. you're, you're suggesting that you have a team of people. Um, I'm assuming maybe they are co-founders. Maybe they are co-founders who are full time, right? Maybe there are two three co-founders. They're all full time already. So I'm assuming, you know, if you've got two, three uh, founders who are all full time, you, you've probably got something which is operational already and therefore you're a later stage deal. Um, if that's the case, then yeah, we can definitely discuss it. Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if you've got a team of founders who are at ideation stage and all need a full time job. Um, so it kind of if, if that's the, 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 the place that you're coming from, then almost, you know, probably not. Um, I, I'd be quite 
surprised if, if we would offer kind of a team of founders salaries at ideation stage that just doesn't quite make sense um, but if it's a later stage company um, where you have a team of founders and if we're still providing value uh, then yeah yeah and I mean, it, it makes perfect sense very good excellent so let's go to the next question tommy it's very interesting to hear that Nova is willing to handhold selected startups to grow from product validation till pre or post funding. What is the best to describe Nova? What is the best way to describe Nova's appetite on industry that startup focuses? What is what is what is Nova's favorite in industry? Is that what it means? Yeah, I think so. I think it's saying what's the what view is, on. Yeah, so, so I'll take this one. Um, Nova, as a rule, is as agnostic as possible towards growing markets. Um, and that's because we truly believe we have no answers inside the building. And our whole model is to partner with people who can tell us about an interesting market, the way it's set up and why we should move into it with them and help them collaborate. Um, so there is no industry as long as it's somewhat technical or digital or hardware or software or has some element of, of rapid scalability, then we are interested in looking at that. Now, obviously as a, both from coincidence and from strategy, we've ended up with more investments in certain areas and we've grown our expertise there. They mentioned them before it's, it's like healthcare and we've done a lot of B2B stuff, a lot of B2C stuff. But ultimately, if you if you can articulate an interesting market opportunity to us, we will move into it. We've done education stuff. We've done um, consumer. We've got an app that helps people play Dungeons and Dragons. Like we've done consumer tech. We've got a bunch of hardware projects. So it's about finding the right people who can tell us about the right markets rather than because if we already knew which markets we'd go into, then we wouldn't need to do this whole program. Mm. So um, we're, we're, we're absolutely interested in hearing about any new space that founders want, want to explore. Very interesting. And w one of the things that I have noticed is that Nova has invested quite a lot into hardware startups, which is um, an in a different kind of startups from other investors, other investors, sometimes they only do software, right? So what is it? Tell me a little bit about hardware startups. Sure. Um, and how, how you do that. Yeah, uh, they, from... they, they are obviously uh, different, mostly governed by their ability to test products. So software, you expect to move a lot quicker because you can develop and distribute the product much and test it much faster. Hardware, obviously, there's there's larger loops of, of, of product design and development, which slows down the testing loop. We still follow a very similar methodology. It's still around evidence and iteration and customer development. But we understand that a lot of the hardware companies are going to just go at a slightly slower rate due to that testing um, cycle. They also often... Um, need to get some sort of accreditation, whether it's consumer accreditation or a health tech accreditation. So a lot of the milestones are factored in around what do we need to do to run that trial or get that validation? Um, or how do we get pre-contracts in place so that when the product is ready, we've got confidence that it's going to okay. be sold. So whilst there's a more heavy building cycle, all of the same activity still happens in terms of customer development. Um, so whether you're a founder of software or hardware or both, you're basically going to be outside the building doing sales, talking to users and making sure that whatever's being built is being tested correctly. Um, hardware is just a slightly different cycle. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, um, Alistair. No, I think you've like, covered it pretty much there. Uh, yep. bad, really. Very good. Uh, let's go to the next one, and this is a very interesting one. What if a co-founder, what, what, what if one of the co-founders can already develop the MVP? Does it make sense for them to work with Nova, or maybe it makes sense for them to work with another kind of product? Yeah, I mean, um, we can share this one, Luke. So um, it's an interesting question, and again, isn't it? Because it says, what if one of the founders could develop the MVP? Um, so alluding to a later stage startup, um, if, if there are multiple founders or a team really early on and, and they're just thinking about doing something. So again, where, where Nova really adds value is um, the combination of its, its 12 years worth of learning, the, the methodology that we bring, the operations and the infrastructure, as well as the resource on top. 
Um, so if, if there is a founder who could develop an MVP, and an MVP again is, is such a kind of a, an ambiguous term in that it could be a spreadsheet um, all the way up to a hardware product. Uh, it could be anything in between. So without knowing the exact details around there, we definitely can work with somebody which can develop an MVP, um, but it's critical that they buy into, understand and follow the learnings that we have had. The, the kind of the, the red kind of the, the, the flare that shoots up when if a founder says, I've got an MVP or I can develop the MVP is it, it, it sends a warning signal off that it's probably going to be a lot of founder bias in that yeah. they want to develop the thing that's in their head and they have the skills to do so. Um, now, just because somebody can develop an MVP shouldn't be the reason that we don't work with them. Um, but there are a number of other factors that we'd have to look into. Okay. Yeah, I think just to add to that, obviously, if, if you can build an MVP and, and improve the evidence you're generating about a market, that only increases your application and, and the strength of your company. Um, and, and we've worked with people with, when we say MVP, you know, you could be referring to like a, 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 a simple website with a sign up form and a bit of a process that you do behind it. And we look to try and get you to as close to product market fit as we can, which means taking whether it's that idea or that very basic MVP and getting it to a product ready, you know, this is something that can self service and, and help people out. So depending on the view of the founders in question, maybe you can build your initial MVP. If you still see value in that whole process from, from version one to version that satisfies the market, then it, it makes sense that it's actually a good application for us that, that you've gone to that effort and, and tried to implement something. It's where if you value that too highly, then, then why would you want to give away, well, why would you want to bring on a team of technical advisors if you do feel like you've, you've got a good solid idea of an MVP and you don't think you're going to need that many iterations? So for us, it wouldn't be a no-go. It's something to consider, um, but it makes us skeptical that, that are we going to be able to add the value that another founder would definitely recognize on the basis they hadn't generated one? And are they going to be able to leave any biases or emotional attachment at the door? If we say mm -hmm. great evidence, rubbish product, we want to throw it out. We want to start again, but great evidence. How would they feel about that kind of thing? So it's all on the table and it can actually help a lot of the time if you've tried something, but it depends how much you value that really. And, and are you willing to go back through a, a painful process of, of evidence gathering to make sure that it's it's the right MVP. Okay, very good. Next question is, how do I fix an appointment with Luke to discuss on my link canvas for his inputs? Yeah, um, so what we're gonna do, um, we've got about 70 people here. So I think we're gonna send a form out um, just, to, just, to make, just to get final numbers on who's interested in proceeding after today and then we'll be able to work out how available each person can be. But everyone so will have the chance to book our team. Um, there will be a link that gives you straight access to our calendars and you'll be able to organize a meeting. But yeah, we'll, 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 we'll confirm numbers, I think, as we move through to next week. And then we'll be able to have a better idea of how often you can book us and stuff. But everyone who proceeds will have the chance to get their, their feedback. Very good. Next question is, what if we have created a partnership to package our apps with another company in order to sell to market a B to B to C kind of partnership. Yeah, um, I'll take this one again. Um, so, obviously, um, route to market and, and potential sales we've gone over is very exciting to us. Um, with all of these things, if if we make a, an agreement that we're going to work on the basis of this partnership, then. We are going to ask to see some evidence that it exists, that you've got some written intent to do so. Um, and we also don't like, you know, that should be an addition to your to your strategy for gaining customers, but it, you shouldn't be entirely reliant on a partnership with a third party company at this stage because it can really slow down your own um, um, testing um, and your own kind of focus on product development. So absolutely it can, can include it as part of the um, application. Consider how you would show the investors how it would work. Like, is there a, is there a bit of written intent? Is there a, um, a, a, a loose set of agreements signed up? You know, what evidence, what data can you give us? And ultimately, make sure that you, if you've got a partnership, make sure that you've got your own methods of gaining customers as well, though, so that if that one gets delayed or gets taken away, 
you're not left with, with absolutely yeah, nothing, so. Okay, very good. Uh, excellent, the next question is, I have completed uh, watching all the videos in LeanStack, I have filled up the Lean Canvas and Traction Roadmap, but I need advice to know if I am in the right track. Can I fix an appointment before submitting the deck? And if yes, how, how do I do that? Uh, I think we have kind of answered that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna share a, a way of, of setting an appointment, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, answer live. Uh, next is, what is the most convincing point for Nova to support the founders apart from the product that people are looking for? Is it a sustainable business model, certain industry or other point? Please elaborate and cheers from Jakarta. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's enough, I guess. So it's a, it's a really good question. So I guess like we, we've talked a lot about going from zero to one and a lot around product. And, and you know, I, I, I didn't see the person's name before it went off the screen, but they clearly picked up that, you know, a, a big part of, of getting a business into market is product. And therefore a lot of the conversation has been around product. The, the, the probably the most compelling thing for Nova's business model and, and, and where we bring value is we've been doing it for 12 years and we, you know, we've made mistakes along those 12 years and you're getting access to that knowledge bank that we've built up over 12 years. And what we've learned and, and the reason we've built the business model is, and, and this was touched on right at the top, is all the reasons for failure. Um, and what one of those, and it, it's a, a large one, which, which is kind of come around in spades um, with, with COVID is that taking on costs too quickly. So, I think like that there was a conversation earlier on um, around like bringing members of staff in and all that kind of stuff. Essentially, a startup is is a temporary business in in, in that you're, you're largely at research and development phase. What we are experts in is research and development. Um, we're experts over that those twelve years. We we know how to quickly assess. Uh, market, create experiments, develop, um, deliver those experiments, get the learnings and iterate the product um, um, quickly. Um, so yes, you, you're getting developers, um, but what you're really getting access to is, is a team of people. You know, we employ over 100 people to be working as your co-founders every single day uh, doing this work. And when you look at what's happened within the startup sector over COVID, it kind of is borne out perfectly to, to explain our model in that startups that get a large uh, investment, take on a load of staff, and then their market is, is shut down for some market force, which is outside of their control. Um, they still have to pay those costs. In our business model, we're paying those costs. So, so we're able to flex the resource to match whatever's happening in your market. And whether that is we need to speed up or slow down, we take that whole infrastructure and cost part of everything other than the task that you're doing is our responsibility to look after and manage. And therefore, you, you've, you've got an, an immediate distinct advantage over uh, your closest competitor that may be starting at the same time. Okay, uh, very good. So let's go to the next question, which is regarding, this is Grace, Grace question. Regarding the traction roadmap, can you elaborate on the minimum success criteria you are looking for when selecting companies to invest, to co-found, for example? Will you only invest in companies that are realistically projected to reach X amount uh, in revenue by the end of year three? And if so, what that amount would be? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. Um, we do have our own rules of thumb for like what will return uh, you know, an investment to Nova and, and where we would like to get to. But there's, two, there's, there's a few answers to this question. Yes, we do have a minimum success criteria. It's a few million at least by year three, let's say four or five million. But it, you know, that's all within the context of the rest of the application. If it's a small market and and you know um, you need to gain a, a large amount of, of of market penetration to get that, does that you know we we take a view on does that seem realistic? If it's a huge huge market and and it seems really low amount to get, then obviously on the face of it that would look good. But actually, is that too vague? So. The traction roadmap is done within context of the rest of the application. There is minimum success criteria and it is a few million pounds in revenue. But what I would really say to everyone on the call is this is your business right now. Don't 
this is about you modeling it to the growth that you want to see and modeling it to where you want to get it to. And just because we have a minimum success criteria that would, you know, we, A, we can talk about that if it's something you really want to be flexible on, but B, this is much more as about getting alignment, making sure that we both want to grow the company at a similar rate, that it doesn't seem too unrealistic, that it doesn't seem too small and making sure that, you know, you're not getting, we shouldn't be telling you what the minimum success criteria is in, in your business, just so you can work with us. You know, that we want to both grow the company. We've got rules of thumb that help us determine how close you are to that. But if you don't want to grow the company according to our minimum success criteria, then, then, then you shouldn't necessarily do that. So feel free to take away from this answer that if you haven't put a few million quid in by year three and you can't kind of show the path there, that it might be difficult for us to, to, to visualize the return. Okay. But, but you shouldn't just go put three million quid in if that's not what you think the company can do. We'd rather talk from a point of view of being realistic and 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 true to, to the ambition that you've got um, than just fiddling it to make it hit the number. Okay, okay, good. Alistair is going to have to leave uh, soon. Uh, so Alistair, just please leave when, when you need, no problem at all. Luke is going to stay here. We're going to try to answer all the questions. So Alistair, when you need to leave, yes, uh, yeah. don't, don't worry. Um, we have here an interesting question about basically what happens if the startup fails, right? So the question says, hey guys, much apologies for asking a party pooper question. Yeah. Just a thought, uh, just a, a thought though, assuming after Nova's help and first round of investment through, if the product fails with the, par with the partnership and the partnership dissolves, um, and hands it over to the founder or to, does, does it hand, I, I don't know if I understand the question is that, I mean. Yeah, um, I think I understand. I mean, the question is what happens to the founders uh, where if the partnership with Nova fails, if the product fails, uh, how, how do you find a solution? Does the equity go back to the founders? Uh, what happens there? Yeah, great question. Um, so the first thing to, to understand is that during the process, there's lots and lots of different opportunities to speak to the key people at Nova and get feedback on the progress you're making. And to make sure there's alignment, this is, a, this is you know, a partnership, you know, we're not teacher and student, it's a partnership. So we should be fairly aligned the whole way going through. And if we're honest about the data, then, um, then we'll know in advance that this concept is not resonating with the market at the rate we want it to. And um, that's when we've got options to try and fix that. Now, if we both agree that the, the product isn't ready for the market or the market isn't really there, then the obvious thing to do is say, okay, well, I feel like we've saved everyone a whole bunch of time. We've learned some stuff. Let's not invest any more into this market that doesn't exist. Let's start again with, with a better concept and a better proposition. And we've had people come back through again and again once we find the right founder. If we, I think where your question is, though, is more about what happens if we disagree, you know, Nova thinks that it's no good or, or, or and, and the founder thinks that, that it is good, you haven't been able to provide the support I need and that's why we're here, then it's that misalignment that gives us questions then. And it's all, to be honest, quite flexible. You know, if, if it's a complete disalignment conflict um, and we just can't move forward, there has been occasions where we've just completely exited the business, relinquished all equity, we don't want anything to do with it and, and you guys can take it away and, and do what you want. If we both believe in the business, but we want to do it in different ways, and we both invested a certain amount, then we just need to come to an arrangement that allows the company to move forward and, and, and be, be sensible in that sense. And, you know, we've got a large portfolio of companies that we support during really fragile times. So we understand how difficult it can be at that nine month period, even if things are going well to raise money. So the most common thing that happens at nine months is we continue to support the company until they're in a position to raise money and in a position to take away the down the direction they want to go in. So even if we have some disagreement and you're ready to, to start scaling up, we'll still support you until that point when you're ready. And then as alluded to earlier by Paul, look to sell our equity at the next rounds. We still will have invested all that time and support in getting you there. So there's plenty of options when we get to the nine months. Typically, we carry on working. Sometimes we do a clean break uh, and other times we give up all of our equity, but that's really the last thing we want to do. We want to support um, 
all mm. of our companies to the best of our ability and you know and you have to remember you know we deal with dreams and ideas and visions and better life and it's it can be very emotional for our founders so sometimes you know we just need to let them have a bit of space and, and let them do what they need to do so yeah. there's no clear answer like this happens um but there will be a constant conversation until that point with the nova team and yourself so that we're all aligned hopefully on what on what should happen very good well now we have a very interesting question here from jeffrey um in the event that there are revenue generated from the mvp where does the revenue go to yep. uh, does the founder need to register and incorporate a country in a, a company in their country with nova i understand that's the uk in the uk with nova for the partnership or the company can be registered in in singapore or in indonesia or in malaysia mm -hmm. and uh, and then the next question is i would say it's not written here but i would say if the company has to be registered in the uk is there a possibility to bring it back to asia uh, how, how does it work in terms of this uh, legal uh, considerations which uh, many of them at the end of the day um, are important because of a tax uh, because of tax reasons right yeah absolutely so um yeah thanks for the for the question um revenue generated from the mvp in the business you know we're not interested in taking dividends out of the company you know if you make money on a customer we want that money to, to stay and grow the company that generated it whether that means the founder taking some money to make sure that they're supported and can keep growing whether it means more marketing budget whatever but we're not looking to gain small drips and drabs of revenue we are absolutely in for the equity play and we'll make money when we sell that equity and when you're successful so so that's the key thing um yeah it, within terms of where to register the business so as we as we move in more and more into to asia and, and obviously work with this cohort of businesses to try and find them the right route to funding there are two main options so if you'd like to be considered by the uk's in that Nova's UK investors, then we'll need to set up a company in the UK because the way we raise money is based on a tax incentive scheme provided by our government to, to allow people to invest early stage at less risk. And every company, no matter you know where you're based today, because there'll be a base of operations in the UK by using some Nova resource, if we decide to work together, then, then we're, we're, we're fine to set up that company and help you raise money in the UK. Now, uh, Tom, who's been answering some questions in the chat, is, is helping us um, connect with money in, in the Southeast Asia region. And I think when that, you know, that will be a lot, a bit more flexible, I, I think. And uh, maybe we'll have a session or a bit for someone like Tom or maybe someone from our investment team to come and explain a bit more of the, the details on the legal. But ultimately, I think there will be the option to keep your business register in Asia and raise money, but it would preclude you from raising money with our UK guys. But look, if we start proceeding into those conversations, that's something that will help guide you guys through and, and, and keep you communicating mm -hmm. with. And if we need, well, you know, for most of our founders, even in the UK, we help them set up the company, we help them register it all properly, we help them um, manage all the, the finances coming in and stuff like that. So they're the two options. Um, Okay, helps. excellent. Yeah. So here there is a question from Budi yeah. from Indonesia. We are already invited for this program. Does it mean that we are already into your program until we finish all the requirements? I think the question could be, I mean, I understand that, but maybe the follow-up question is, okay, if we don't finish all our requirements in this round, mm -hmm. uh, will there be other rounds? Does it work on a rolling basis or, or there is a deadline? Yep. So if you want to be considered to to be invited to our online demo day where many members of the Nova team and some investment partners and, and people like Tom will be there, um, then you will need to have completed all the requirements in advance and be selected to attend that. We probably think there's about 20 to 30 slots, so it's going to be a, a, slight, a fairly competitive program. If you are unable to finish the, pro, the, the requirements in time because you're doing the right steps, you're doing customer validation, you're doing things like that. We will allow anyone who commits to this program to submit after the date. You won't be on the demo day, but you can still proceed through review and feedback, and we can still give it to people like Tom to, 
to, to, to, to take a view on and, and potentially have a share. So, and, and there will be other rounds in the future. So there will be, and there will uh, be other rounds. Yeah. We don't have a set date for our next one. Ultimately it will depend on the success of this, this cohort. You know, this is our focus. The, the 70 people who turned up today um, of, of, of pro progressing you guys into, into that stage. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine this is our last program. Okay. Um, so there'll be other options. Okay. Another question here from Henricus, also from Jakarta, right? Um, well, I'm assuming I'm a, <laughs> sometimes I'm identifying the the people that come from Jakarta or from Malaysia, depending on the names, right? Um, so during, uh, I mean, it might be an Indonesian in, in another country. Uh, during that program, during the program, if there is another venture that is willing to invest, I, I would assume if there is another venture capitalist, if there is another venture investor that is willing to invest to another stage of funding, is it okay? Yeah, so so we actually love co-investment, you know, and our whole model is, is is designed on building an ecosystem to lower the risk for every startup. So if you have got any sort of funding um, that you can help bring to the table and support that company, we are absolutely willing to talk about, about co-investing with them. If they're willing to come in later, that's fine. Many people don't want to come in at the very early stage and just getting an idea as we progress what types of um, connections those would be be really useful. But yeah, any you know, we look at all companies a bit differently. Anyone who's got um, the ability to, to raise funding in the early stage or slightly you know, right after that stage provides a, a big advantage to their company that they've got that ability to keep raising cash and, and keep um, developing out. So it's a massive advantage if you've got a small net and any sort of network that can assist to that at whatever stage. Okay, excellent. Very good. Now, from the discussion so far, would it be right to say that Nova is looking to partner with people who can identify problems worth solving and are able to market the solution to the target audience? Yes. So this is, I mean, this is basically uh, the outside the building activities, understanding the customer, uh, liaising with customers, identifying the problem, uh, problem solving about the solution, maybe not implementing the solution, right? Which is... In, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah, you spot it's on. Exactly that, right? Yeah, that's spot on. Very good. So, well, so I, I have answered, we have answered already all the questions that have a vote. So here we still have some questions that don't have a vote. Uh, feel free to vote. We will always go to the, to the most voted one. But let me, let me start uh, selecting here. Um, two questions. Uh, one, who will keep the IP of the product? Two, in the event somewhere along the line, various VCs start wanting to invest and want Nova out from the cap table, how do we best handle this? Yeah, great questions. Um, so the IP, obviously when we co-found a company together, there'll be Nova, there'll be you guys, at Nova, you guys, and a company in the middle that we combine together. This company holds the IP, so the yeah. startup holds the IP. So that's the, that's the key thing. Second thing, yeah, obviously, if we can scale and we can get to Series A, we can get to Series B, like we did with Centric Music and, and Lucid Games. Then what will happen is the, the the cap table needs to change and it needs to be better reflective of the value that's going to be added ongoing. And as you grow out of, of Nova, you know, we're still a startup building startups in many ways. And, um, it, you know, there is a limit to how, how much we can follow on. So what will happen is everything A becomes very flexible when people are successful because everyone wants a part of the pie. So we'll most likely sell our shares to the new people coming in. That would act as a dilution, um, an anti-dilution mechanism for the founder because they'd maintain their shares. And we'd make space to allow people to come onto the cap table in a way that was supportive of the future of the company. So, you know, we've got our own place in the ecosystem. It's at the beginning and for as long as we can keep helping that company. But we are we are aware of the fact that as we move further on, people are going to want to buy our shares out so that it's more reflective of what's happening day to day. So it's it's part of our business model is, is the honest answer. And, and it's nothing that concerns us. Like we're, we're more than willing to be flexible once we can get past these initial stages and prove that the company is valuable. Okay, good. Uh, another interesting question here 
from this month. If we know a few problems in the market, is it possible to discuss with NOVA to see which one is the best problem to solve? Or maybe uh, they have to prioritize themselves and then choose one of them, develop that one, and, uh, and, and that discussion will happen on, on, on one problem. Yeah, so we can obviously um, we can obviously talk through each of the different problems that you're spotting, and 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 try and lead you to the right answer. The key thing is is, is we don't want to bias you with what we think. Otherwise, we just wouldn't need to do any of this. Like I, I just run the the companies and come up with ideas, and, and we just do that. Um, but we've tried that, and it it didn't work super well. So for me, it's. Um, Whilst we're happy, you know, I'll bounce ideas off with you, Desmond. We'll talk about where the best traction is coming from. We'll ultimately be looking at you got you to prioritize which is the right plan to follow and where do you need support. And the great news is if you're not ready to do that, that's just more options for more experiments to really find out where the best place to focus is. Um, for this process, I would recommend trying to build traction with each of them as soon as you can so that you can pick the one with the most engagement from users um, and, and focus on that but the process that you're going through it was absolutely applicable to all of them as long as you've got the energy and the time there's no reason that you can't test out one or two or three different business models during this period um, and we love that you know the more data we learn from failure as much as we learn from success so um yeah I, I encourage you to experiment with all of them pick one to focus on but if you really want to bounce ideas we will but we, we can't tell you which one to, to focus on okay very good. There is an, an operational question here, which I find quite interesting because it's very different from our questions. It comes from Arman, and basically it's asking how do you manage priorities in the, in the technology team? How do you staff your technology team? How do you assign uh, people to, to startups? Um, so with, quite, with a quite amount of portfolios that you manage, how is the priority management going in your technology team? Yeah, great. Um, great question, Arman. So um, when we work out which company we're going to work with, we draw up a resource profile right there of, of what they're going to need and which developers they're going to need. And, and because we're agreeing a period of work together, once you've got the team that, you, that you've got surrounded with you, that that's your team, then they work on that company for that amount of time prioritized. So you know, it's not a centralized team that you just drag people from. They are small teams that have been um, resourced to each individual project and won't come off them until until they're done. So there's no, you know, that's how we, we resource at the beginning. If something needs to switch, maybe it will, but there's a lot of, um, you get a lot of time to plan for that as, as we move through. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, are founders allowed or have founders invested their own funds in the various rounds of investment? Um, yeah, we, we prefer not, prefer not to, because I think, I don't know, it, it always didn't sit quite right with us that, that the founder was, was putting his own cash in necessarily, especially when, with the way it's all structured. I mean, we could talk about it. Um, there's no reason that we, that we, that we would outright say no. But our model setups that you don't have to put your own cash in where and that comes with the emotional burden that comes with more stress of getting it right um, and, and not for the right reasons. So we pride ourselves on creating an, an, an honest environment of innovation. And the reason we do that is that you haven't put cash in. So you don't feel as if you've got to go fat, super, super fast because you're paying for this. You know, we, we've helped provide the resource to do that. So um, it's not something we look for. It's something we could discuss if you were really passionate about doing so and preserving some equity and stuff. But yeah, it's it's we would prefer, in fact, to fund the first round, keep it low stress, as low stress as it can be. And then maybe in those future rounds, if you're really, really passionate about investing in your own company, then maybe that's the time to do it. But um, yeah. And what will happen, uh, Luke, for example, if a founder has invested some money uh, creating an MVP uh, or, or, or maybe doing some marketing for the consumer research, maybe maybe paying for some Facebook advertisement. Uh, what if the, the founder has already invested something before, before the, Nova, the Nova program? 
Yeah, I mean, I do believe that people who have invested and tried to do things are just going to have a far better chance of getting invested in by us or somebody yeah. else. It's not something we'd be looking to, to re- reimburse people for, unfortunately. You know, it's everyone here is is aware of the, the potential reward of getting a company, a tech company up and scaled and, and exited. So look, you know, if you want to spend some money to validate out your own business, that's absolutely your choice. You, It's not, you know, I wouldn't encourage you to spend a lot of money. Um, but yeah, if you've spent a few hundred pounds or if you, you know, yeah. Yeah, get that then then that's your choice really it's something i'd encourage it's not something you have to do um but it's not something that, you should, that if you keep an expense sheet anyone's going to pay you back for um you know it, it's really something that you've done to push your company forward and I, and, and I applaud anyone who can um but do that's better to almost do that and bootstrap it a bit and, and try and grow it rather than saying yeah i'll put 50 grand in like um you know it'll all get paid back in the end once once the company is hopefully successful yeah so it's it's, it's a small amount anyway okay understand um how does nova work with startups on heavy regulated industries uh where that have government restrictions but the problem is real as government make an effort but the government is making an effort to restrict it does Nova work in highly regulated industries, like, for example, healthcare? Yeah, so, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, if the government is trying to restrict it, as in, like, they're trying to say it shouldn't be in the country and we're in direct competition with, with regulation, then, that, then that's mm-hmm. one thing. We'd have to look into that. Probably not. But do we work in highly regulated areas? Absolutely. You know, we work with healthcare. We work with children. We work with children in healthcare, which is like your double whammy for data protection and, and having all the and, and, and regulatory stuff and getting your, your, your medical certifications and, and all those things. So we're absolutely comfortable working to regulation. It can be a really good problem. But when I read it, if it's something that, that the government doesn't want to be there, then then we'd have to take a view on that on an individual basis. Like, for instance, in the UK right now, um, e-scooters are kind almost legal. Like, they're not quite, but there are companies investing into scooters in the UK because they know that it will be soon. So that's something where the regulation is saying no, but actually everyone can tell that it will happen. So there's obviously views like that you can take on regulation. Um, but yeah, so we're comfortable working within it. Probably not against it, but there are exceptions to every rule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, an interesting question here. I already have a startup company ready. And uh, now, right now, I need funding for expansion and coverage throughout Indonesia. Uh, is this the kind of, is this the kind of startup? So this is like a, a scale up funding, I understand. Uh, is this the kind of thing that Noah would consider? So, yeah, I think, um, I think you know, t- t- I saw Tom messaging in the chat again before, you know, we're trying to figure out the best way to connect as many people as possible with the right funding routes. Now, on the face of it, based the reason you're asking the question is probably because you're seeing that actually a lot of the work we do is innovation and creation rather than distribution and growth it is something we can absolutely look at but you're right it, it's probably not quite our bag if you've got something that satisfies the market and you're it sounds like you might be at a scale round which is a little bit ahead of us but i think what we can do you know we're going to be looking to connect with as many investors as possible on this whole cohort so if you go through the process and it's not quite right for Nova. Look, A, I'll give you the feedback. I'll give you the chance to be flexible. But B, we can probably put you in with other businesses and get your help you um, get your pitch out there and find the right investors for you who might still want to work with us on other projects, but on this one, you can go direct. So if it's not quite right, but we see a good connection, we'll, we'll probably pass you on to someone. Um, we'll give you the chance to be flexible. But yeah, based on what I just read, um, it's probably not quite as well aligned with some of the other deals that are likely to be in play. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so there is a question here about the process, right? As of now, well, there are a few questions about the process. So let's let's go over them. We have explained the process, the application process. As of now, I assume that we have selected 
by NOVA for the program or will you select after the webinars, right? So the thing is, um, there are gonna be these five webinars. The last one is the demo day. Uh, during the previous webinars, people, some, some candidates will be invited to pitch in the demo day. Um, and that selection will be made only among people who have submitted all the required materials, right? That's uh, That will be the answer. And then from those that pitch in the demo day, then th those are the ones that are finally considered. Is that correct, Luke? Yeah, you're spot on. Everyone here is invited to the next free uh, webinars, definitely, if you'd like to attend. From that, we'll be looking at the, the, the stuff that you guys have created, the canvases. You'll, ha you'll have had the chance to book us and talk to us a bit. And then we'll invite the people who are still engaged to the pitching workshop. Um, everyone and everyone who will have submitted the activity will be invited to that. There'll be no, there'll be no call based on quality at that point. It'll be based on um, engagement and making sure that you guys have came to the content and you've produced what we need to see. Um, but then at that point, we'll have to make a decision on how many companies we can have at the demo day and, and we'll have mm. to pick our favorites to invite. Now, at that point, you'll get a communication saying you've either been invited to the demo day or um, you haven't and, and here are the next steps. And those next steps will probably still involve you being able to proceed in some way, just not you might have missed the, the, the demo day itself. So from a point of view of you're all on the program, yes, you can all complete the program, get a pitch video, get feedback and hopefully be in a good position to raise funds. And I, push, I, I think about half of you will be invited onto the demo day um, and have the chance to pitch to, to the wider okay. network directly and take connections from there. Very good. Here we have a question from, from Singapore, I believe. Um, very interesting question as well. Glad to listen to Mr. Paul. When Paul is talking about investment, does it mean that as a co-founder, Nova also invests some funds into the startup? So the question is basically, from the investment that you make, how much goes into services, yeah. how much goes into cash, yeah. um, do, do they get some cash, it's all services. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the overall, the way to think about it is over nine months, you'll receive a resource budget. So this is money to be spent on Nova resource of 260,000 UK pounds uh, and 40,000 UK pounds of cash will be left in the company to do stuff, pay for stuff, help grow the company. Um, I don't, sorry, I didn't work out the, the, the domestic rates for all the people on the call, but um, yeah, so it's, it's 260 and then 40K. Um, so if you want to put that in, but that's how, that's how it breaks down. So there is some cash, yeah. But a lot of it is spent on resource. Okay, okay. Uh, excellent. There is a question here. Will Nova help me to get my visa for a startup in the UK as I would like to be based in the UK? Um, uh, probably one for our HR and investment team. It's not something we've done in the past. We've, we've only mm -hmm. got visas for our employees um, and for people in our, in our employment in, in Pakistan. Um, maybe under exceptional circumstance or maybe after a period of, of say the nine month period, if then you wanted to be based in the UK and it made sense for the company, then we could support you in doing that. But it's not something that we lead with, so to speak. Uh, you probably, you know, we're looking right now, everyone on this call, you are absolutely permitted to be where you are right now to be on the program mm -hmm. and to work with us. Like we're very used to working remote. So it's not a necessity that you come to the UK and it's probably not something we can help support you with until we know you a lot better, which is probably after the initial investment period. That's interesting. You just mentioned Pakistan, and you are the first person to mention Pakistan in 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 this panel. That's that's um, um, that's something interesting because you have a team. Nova has a team in Pakistan. So tell us about uh, the companies. I mean, you 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 have a headquarters in Liverpool, a uh, technology team in Pakistan. Tell us a little bit how you are organized geographically. Yeah. So well. We used to all be in the Liverpool office um, on most days, but now we're all over we're all over the UK. I'm still in Liverpool, um, thankfully, but you know, uh, Joe, who's on the call, he's he's in Durham. Um, obviously, Pedro, you're you're in uh, Kuala Lumpur. So all the people we work with, whether they work for Nova or work as partners with Nova, like like Pedro, you know, it's we're very familiar with working online, very familiar with working remote. Uh, the, the Pakistan office and the UK office have been working together for 12 years now. You know, they, they are one company. We both 
go back and forth. We, we, we share all our projects together and every business is a blend of that. And that's because, you know, we believe as working as a startup, it's about getting the right skills and getting the right teammates. And it's not about all being together anymore. Um, so, so we've got headquarters in the, in Liverpool, we've got little satellite offices in London and Manchester and around the UK, so we can better service founders there. We'll be looking to set up um, as an office in the Southeast Asia region as soon as we can get um, work through this cohort and work out what, what a good, um, you know, portfolio of investments would look like. But all of our work happens in the cloud. You know, you'll be partnered with people living in Liverpool, living in London, living in, uh, we've got a few people moving to Europe for a little bit, just, I think, get, get out of the UK while it's um, on fire. <laughs> um, well, I mean, Euro Europe is not much better. Yeah, uh, so Cyprus is apparently, yeah, yeah. COVID, uh, uh, yeah. Well, and that's uh, why we can work with, with people and, you know, we're not going to start an office straight away in, in, in Southeast Asia because anyone on this call, we can absolutely work through Zoom and through online collaboration and through through clever project management until a point where we can be together a bit more um, and start creating that office. So well, that's a very interesting thing what you just said about the offices and uh, and the, the Southeast Asia office, right? So, uh, so people who uh, participate, people who get funded in this round. This is not a question that is made in the in the Q and A question. It's a question I'm asking. People that get funded in this round. Um, are they going to start working with that Pakistan office of developers and technical professionals and, and people in Liverpool uh, while the Asia office is built or will they have to wait until the Asia office or how, how is it, is it going to work? No, yeah, you won't have to wait. Um, I don't know when we'll open the office over there. Obviously, everything's changed in the last year. So we are doing all of our work remotely right now. Mm -hmm. So we, we can start, um, you know, resource permitting, founder permitting, investment permitting, all those things. We, we can start straight away. And we wouldn't want you to have to wait for us to start an office just to start your own startup. So we'd be looking to, yeah, to, to, to go straight away. understand. Very good. Well, so there is here a, an interesting question from Rose. So regarding the salary of the founder, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, in, in, in the startup period, is it allowed to hire people uh, already uh, then as part of operational expenses? Can you hire people outside the Nova team that is allocated to you as part of operational expenses? Imagine, for example, this is a startup that requires a salesperson on the ground, uh, a business development person on the ground. Is it something that can be done? Uh, is it considered part of the services, part of the investment? Certainly, it's something that can be done with the cash part of the investment, right? Uh, but how, how, how does it work? Yes, great question. I mean, often, you know, we like to try and provide you with everything you need in year one because you don't, you know, you, you don't really want the stress of hiring people. Like your main your main focus as an early stage startup is to, is to innovate and create a product, not to make enough money to pay your staff. Because if they leave, they're going to take half the information with them. So it okay. is our least preferable thing to do is to hire actual employees into an early stage startup before, before they're ready. However, every startup is different. There are always exceptions. We have a startup that is marketing itself in India. And the only way to grow it was to, to get some, to, to some, some staff on the ground there. So, Whilst it's a consideration, the first step would be to say, well, can we can we deliver what you need through the Nova team, through the founder, through our ability without taking on that expense? The second thing then would be if the answer is no, then yeah, we could look at hiring someone short term to fill that gap. Um, but as, as you know, premature scaling is is like number one, you know, big killer of startups. And as soon as you make that commitment, you now have a whole new set of responsibilities um, that you're that, that aren't just about innovating your product and, and making it work for, for customers. So not our preference, Rose, um, but if you truly believe there was something that your company needed that we weren't providing, then there's no reason that we couldn't support, um, that we couldn't agree on that. Okay, um, excellent. Uh, when will the discussion, we have referred in this conversation about the possibility that um, uh, idea originators or founders have a conversation with the 
investment team, like for example, with you, with Alistair. Uh, when is this discussion uh, going to happen? Is it gonna be after we complete the online section of the program? When is, when is that gonna happen? Uh, I, I guess the question is during these five weeks of, of webinars, uh, when, when is that gonna happen and what are the requirements to be invited to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Is it that they have to at least have finished a complete application? Uh, is it, how, how, how will it work for this yes. uh, discussion? So, so to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with me, um, if you've completed the content and, and the canvas and you want some feedback, I will, I will meet with you. But my, my opinion isn't what will get you invested in by the Nova team. I'm here to run the program, help guide you guys and help make sure that um, enough good companies get to the end, essentially. And actually, it'll be each of the investment committee's decision on, on which ones they follow up. So for you guys on the program, the best way to get um, a meeting with them is to complete the demo day, do the pitch, and then everyone that uh, is interested will, will will write down which companies they're interested in, we'll take it offline and we'll partner you up with those people. And um, in that pitch day will be the key people at Nova. So they'll be making notes of the startups that they wanna meet and they wanna work with. So that's when we'd um, take the conversations offline and, and move forward into talking about the best way to support the company with investment or, or um, mm -hmm. co-foundry. Okay, very, very good. Uh, so this question is uh, done, and then here is a Nova. Is the Nova pro is there a Nova program always open every year? How long period from one program to another program to the next Nova program? Right. So in Asia, this is the first one, right? Um, and in the UK, uh, how do cohorts work? Uh, do you have? A, is it is it is it that the investment committee meets quarterly, monthly, uh, how, how do you organize yourselves? I, I think you are mute now, we cannot hear yeah, you. Yeah, no, it's in, in the yeah. UK, it's a, it's a constantly open program. The investment committee meets between once every four and six weeks to, to look at the shortlist and work out how they want to move forward and prioritize the work and, and, and go forward that way. Yes, our mm -hmm. first program in Asia, it's, um, the first time we've put such a, a deadline on it, but that's because we're really confident that what we need is to help, you know, spread our brand, work with you guys, gather a whole bunch of businesses together and, and run the program properly. Um, and then ultimately help a whole bunch of you, hopefully um, connect with funding and, and, and move your companies forward. So we'd probably be looking to run another one of these right after Christmas, because that'll probably be, I think demo days yeah. at the end of, demo days in November. There'll be two or three weeks after that that people are getting followed up with and we'll go through discussion and we'll make some offers. The ones that get accepted will be all packaged up and we'll set them up in December. And then we'll probably be ready in January or February to run another program here. So if you miss this one because you're not quite ready, don't worry. Um, okay. you, you, you can either come back. Yeah, or you can communicate with myself and Pedro. Let us know what you're up to and we can always take a, a view on, on okay. where you've got to and, and move stuff forward in isolation. So. Very good. So now it is exactly 10 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur and in Singapore. It is 9 p.m. in in Jakarta. Yeah. Uh, three o'clock in the uh, At two o'clock. Three no, o'clock. Three o'clock. Three o'clock yeah. in uh, in Liverpool. Um, I think we have gone over most of the questions. I see here some questions, uh, but they are a kind of particular cases, right? Um, I, I, there, is, there is a new question here. We, I think we have answered that, but let's, let's go over it again. What is the amount, so that it is clear for everyone, right? What is the amount of funding that, that NOVA does invest in a startup? Yeah. Uh, so, so it, like again, it's a split of resource and cash, but it's, it's around, it's a 300,000 pound total budget. So, it's, it's it's a total investment of three hundred thousand. It's around three hundred thousand pounds, yeah. which uh, is gonna be more around three hundred fifty thousand US dollar, uh, approx. Uh, we, we you can convert it to to ringgit, to Singapore dollar, or to or to rupiah. Uh, excellent. So um, 
th there are four questions here, as I say, they are more of particular cases. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much to, uh, for, to, to everyone for having stayed here with us for two hours. Uh, it has been a pleasure to be with you. If you have any questions, you can, you can contact uh, us. There is an email address that, address that is asia at wearenova.co.uk. Asia at wearenova.co.uk. You can ask questions there. And uh, perfect. So uh, it has been a pleasure for me to ask, to, mo to moderate this panel. Uh, I think I have, I have learned a lot with Luke. Uh, with Paul, Professor Paul, with Alistair. I hope everyone here in this call has learned a lot as well, uh, the same way that I have done. I think we all have learned a lot from each other. And thank you so much to everyone. And we hope to see you uh, over the next few weeks in the, in the, next, uh, in the next sessions. OK? Yeah, well, thank you, excellent. everyone. Perfect. Uh, have a nice, uh, have a good night. Yeah, good night, everyone. Thank <laughs> you, Pedro. Asia, and then, and then you, Luke, you, you might need to go for lunch or. I, or... I, uh, I've still got my uh, sandwich here that I, I didn't want to <laughs> eat on camera, so uh, I'm going to do that. But uh, okay. th thank you, Pedro. You've run a really thank engaging you. session. Thank you. See you soon. Bye bye. Sure. Bye See everyone. You. Bye bye.